because I love speaking to medical students. I really enjoy it when you guys are on your clinical rotations and you guys are on our service. I remember being a medical student and um, at that time it was, very, it was a very challenging time to say the least. It was probably the most challenging time in my life up to that point in my life. And you know, you're trying to learn as much as you can. You know, the hospital is a very different environment than the classroom. And um, you're trying to learn what you can. You're trying to, you know, not get in the way. Um, you want people to like you and to teach you. And you also don't want to bother people. So it's a very interesting dynamic. And um, and at the end of the day, you know, you want to get your good evaluations, and you want, you know, to do good on your um, on your shelf exam. Um, but what resonated with me was that there would always be a few residents or attendings who would. Um, you know, spend a little extra time with me, teach me a topic, or maybe show me how to throw a knot or something. And it was these little things that really meant a lot to me. They were small things, but it's these small things that really stick with you. See, I believe, I believe that here we're all kindred souls. I think we're all on the same path. We're, the only difference is that we're just at little, different levels on that same path. And I think, you know, I look at my fellows and my attendings, and I think I'm on the same path they're on. I look at you guys, you're on the same path that I'm on. And there are kids out in high school or colleges, and they're on the same path that you're on. And I think if we strengthen this connection or this bond between the different stages of this same path, then we can make the transition from every stage to the next more easier and more enjoyable. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, share with you some of the key things that I learned through residence. Um, um, these things that, these are insights and philosophies that have benefited me greatly and I know will benefit you immensely. Most of these things I did not know before I started. Um, things that I wish I did know because um, little did I know um, as a medical student what I had in store for me um, becoming a resident. So I'd like to first start with a story. This was July 1st, 2009. And um, I remember this day vividly. It was my very first day as a resident. And um, frankly, I was frightened. I was very scared. I remember even the night before, I didn't even get any sleep the night before. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, you know, you're a medical student, you, you, know, you go around with the residents, and um, you see what they do and everything, but it's very different when you're the one holding the pager on your ways, and now you have to respond to anything that can happen. Anything and everything that can happen, you're now accountable. So it's very, very different. And it was my first day. I was in South Carolina. I was an intern, and um, I was, didn't know my way around. Didn't know anybody. Everybody was new to me. The hospital was new to me, and I was just trying to figure my way around. And you know, everything went okay. There were no problems. And then it was the end of the day. It was around 6 p.m. And um, I was the I was the guy on uh, on nights. So I was I think, doing a 24-hour shift. So I got the sign out from the day team. Um, they were all going to leave. They told me to do a post-op check, check up on someone who had a carotid and endorectomy earlier in that day. Um, for those of you who don't know what a carotid is, basically it's a procedure where they cut open your carotid artery, they scoop out your atherosclerosis, and then they, they close the artery. They sew a patch through and they close it. So I said, okay. So I checked up on the guy, and he was doing okay. And um, he was fine. He had no deficits. He looked okay. His vitals were okay. His pain was under control. There were no problems. The plan was for him to go home the very next day. And, um, you know, I was going about doing my other tasks for the night, and then a few hours later in the middle of the night, and I got this frantic phone call from the nurse. She said, you need to come here quickly. This guy's having difficulty breathing, and he's having this huge swelling on the side of his neck. I started freaking out. I ran up there, and I saw this guy. He had this enormous swelling on the side of his neck. His trachea was deviated all the way to the other side. His whole face was purple. I looked up on the monitor. The guy's systolic blood pressures were in the 70s. His heart rate was in the 140s, and he's satting in the 40s. I was literally going to start crapping my pants. Um, anesthesia was up at the bedside. They said, we try to intubate the guy. We can't intubate him. They're bagging him. They said, you need to do something now. Otherwise, this guy's going to die. And I, I didn't know what to do. I, I called my chief resident, he came, he came to the rescue, and he, he opened up this tracheostomy set, and he said, basically, all you need to do is just um, hand me the instruments I need. And he started yelling out instruments, I started handing them to him, he cuts this guy's neck open, he cuts open the trachea, he takes the endotracheal tube, he shoves it down this guy's trachea, we start rolling this guy into the operating room, he's calling the attending on the other line, 
and the attending shows up, we open up the incision, we found blood everywhere, blood's pouring out, we find where it is, and one of the stitches that when they closed the carotid had torn through, and it was pumping arterial blood from his carotid artery. They fixed it, we sent this guy to the ICU. So, when the dust all settled, I asked my chief president, I said, you know, what would have happened if, what would have happened to this patient if you were not available? He said, um, I said, you know, what if you were in the operating room, you know, repairing a ruptured aneurysm or in a trauma or something where you are not available to come? And he said, um, he said, that patient would have died. And I said, no, really, like, what would have happened? He said, that patient would have died. I mean, do you know how to do a trach at the bedside on your very first day of residency? I said, no. He said, would you know how to take him to the OR and open his neck and explore and control the bleeding? I said, no. I said, I knew that intellectually. I could answer that. I knew we needed to get control of the airway. I knew we needed to explore. I knew we needed to get control of the bleeding. But, and I could answer that on multiple choice question. That's easy. I would have gotten that right. <laughs> but I didn't know practically how do I get this guy who's about to die right in front of me to the point where I can actually save his life. I didn't know how I could practically do that. And I realized and at that moment, I realized the, imp the extent of our impact on, on these people. And I realized that if I'm going to be able to know how to do that, that I have to become something that I'm not as of yet. I would have to become an expanded version of myself. I asked myself the question, I said, how do you prepare for something like that? How do you prepare for a situation that's so chaotic or so dramatic, so life and death that without ever actually being in the situation, how do you, how do you, how do you practice that? You can't practice that. You can't read about that and then do that. So to answer that question is key. And that's what I'm here to tell you. It's extremely critical that you gain an in-depth understanding of it so that it doesn't hit you like a ton of bricks like it hit me that day. Because at that moment, you'll be thinking very differently than you do now. And then after five years of several of those types of moments, you'll be thinking very differently and you will become a, a completely different person. So before I, re I reveal those secrets to you, there's another question in there. What about the alternative? I mean, what else could I, I mean, you could just say, you know, this is too crazy, I want out. And we see this quite often. In fact, every year I've been a resident, at least one resident leaves the program and does something else other than surgery. Some years, two or three residents. Um, in fact, 20% of residents who start a surgery residency do not finish. So why is that? What determines whether in the face of adversity, you persevere through it, or you shy away from it and avoid the situation? Well, clearly it's the decision you make. That's obvious. But what is the driving force behind any decision? <clears throat> See, the driving force behind any decision you make is simply your state. It's the state of mind you're in. See, when you're faced with a challenge, your sympathetic nervous system goes up. You know, flight or fight or flight. But the key word is or. It's fight or flight. So what determines whether you fight or whether you run off in flight? And once again, that's the, it's your state. You see, when you're in a strong and confident state, you stand up, you roll up your sleeves, and you get down to it. But when you're weak or fearful or tired, you tend to shy away from things or you become reluctant to do things. You see, if you will, think about a time when you were doing something with such precision, such accuracy, Everything was going so well for you. Things were going so smoothly. Whatever you were doing, maybe you were um, taking a test, reading a book, studying, working out, exercising, running, breaking a foot, whatever you were doing, and you were feeling great, you were feeling so capable. That's called peak state. That moment in time, that's when you're in your peak state of mind. That's when you're at your best. That's when you're functioning at your absolute best. See, the key to not just surviving but to thriving through residency, and frankly in any area of your life, is to always be in that peak state. You must always be in peak state. See, it's easy to get stressed out. It's easy to get overwhelmed by all of your responsibilities. And sometimes we get into these slumps. We get tired, 
and we, these slumps, they can last for more than a few days. They can last for weeks or months or longer. But it's vital that you develop the ability and the skill to get out of overwhelm and to get out of these lousy states and to get yourself into peak state. It's important that you have the capability to do that instantly. So now that we know that state is everything, the next question is, well, what determines your state? And that is your thoughts. I mean, think about it. Thinking is essentially the process of evaluating things. The mental processes determining what things mean to you. Thinking, for the most part, is mental analysis. The process of asking and answering questions in your mind. So what determines this evaluation process? You know, the system in your mind for understanding the meanings of things. That's your belief structure. I mean, here's the thing. What you believe is true is true to you regardless of whether or not it is actually true. Basically, everybody's perception is their reality regardless of what it is in actuality. See, Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So what determines what you believe? Obviously, what you believe determines what you think, and what you think determines your state. What determines your belief systems? Well, obviously, it's your upbringing. It's your parents, your teachers, your coaches, your mentors, your colleagues, your other family members, your past experiences. And through this, through all of this, you develop a certain set of beliefs. And it's those set of beliefs that dictate your behavior. And that is precisely why people who are faced with the same challenge react to it in very different ways. And this is actually the secret to success, and also the secret to failure. You see, your belief system determines your thoughts. Your thoughts put you in a state. Your state determines your decisions. Your decisions lead to your actions, and your actions produces a result. And then the result reinforces your belief system. And it's a cycle. You see, if you start off believing that you are capable of doing something, for instance, and you believe this is true, regardless of what your past references are, what ends up happening is you end up developing positive thoughts about that. And those positive thoughts put you in a confident state to be able to, to do something. So you take decisions that make you want to do it. When you, are, when you take those decisions, it leads to action. And then the action produces a result that, that you actually accomplish something and then you reinforce your belief. See, I told you I could do it. And it goes the other way around. If you don't believe that you're capable or you're not strong enough or you're not smart enough, you're going you're gonna to be put yourself in a lousy state. You're going to take weak action. You're going to get lousy results. See, I told you it's too hard or it can't be done. And it's a spiral. And it can be an upward spiral or it can be a downward spiral. And you, the funny thing is you can choose which direction you want it to be in. Because what's interesting, this is where it gets very interesting. All of the factors I talked about that determine your belief system, your parents, your schools, you didn't choose any of that. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose where you grew up. You didn't choose what school you went to. So essentially, you didn't choose any of your beliefs. I mean, your parents didn't you know, bring you all of the different religious texts and tell you, why don't you read all of these and determine which one you think makes the most sense and then believe it. No, they taught you what they believed. And then now you just happen to believe it because you grew up believing that. So what I'm here to tell you today is that you have to change your beliefs and choose your beliefs. And you have to choose your beliefs about residency and about what it means to you. And you have to change your belief to a belief that empowers you. You have to change your belief so that it puts you in peak state. You have to choose your belief so that you can initiate your success spiral and you can reach all of the goals and dreams you could have ever imagined. You see, if you believe that residency is going to be this difficult, painstaking endeavor, then guess what? It will be. If you believe that during your intern year you're going to be tired and miserable and you're going to get annihilated by it, then guess what? You will be tired and miserable and you're going to get annihilated. However, if you believe that this is a challenge and that more importantly that you're up to the <coughs> challenge, then you will grow and expand enormously. See, I have a conviction that the experience of surgical residency is unparalleled to any other experience. You literally become an expanded version of yourself. You gain capabilities unsurpassed by almost any other profession. You'll discover things you can do, talents and abilities will express through you, and you'll wonder, where did that come from? I didn't know I could do this. I became a witness within myself of this expansion. 
I remember one night, I was a fourth year resident, I was on call, and it was late at night, and it was snowy, and the roads were bad, my attending was at home, and I got a patient came in, multiple gunshot wounds to the chest, abdomen, and neck. This guy came into the trauma room, and all of a sudden, everybody's looking at me. Now I'm the chief resident. Now all of a sudden, I'm the highest level resident in the hospital. We have a, an ED attending who did three years of, of emergency medicine, and now he's a first year attending. So technically, I have more training than the, atten than the ED attending does. And the entire trauma room is looking at me as to what to do. All of a sudden, I found myself saying, we're going to intubate this patient. We're putting bilateral chest tubes. We're putting a subclavian cortis in. We're throwing a cortis in the groin. I need two liters of Bringer's lactate. We're going to activate the massive transfusion protocol. Call, call the OR. We're going up to the, to the uh, operating room. We're prepared for an next lap. Um, we take him upstairs. I call the attending. The attending shows up. We open this guy's abdomen. His stomach is perforated. He's got injuries to his stomach, small bowel, spleen, liver, diaphragm. We repair all this. We send him to the ICU. And then I asked myself, I said, what would have happened if I wasn't there? The same question I asked myself that night when I was an intern. And I realized if I would, that patient would have died. And it's those times that have a profound impact on, on us and on our patients. See, one of the most valuable lessons that I've learned, if not the most valuable, is that you must always be in control of your state. You must always be in peak state. You know that when you're not in your peak state, you're not at your best. You know this. When you're not at your best, there's so much you're missing out on. There's nothing more dissatisfying or unfulfilling to one's soul than knowing that you're capable of doing more or experiencing more and you're not doing it. There's nothing more discouraging than knowing that you have greatness within you, yet you're not manifesting your own greatness. There's nothing more disturbing than knowing that you have everything you need, that all of the resources you need are readily available to you, and they're within you, and that you're just not tapping into them. See, I believe that everybody came here with something. I think everybody showed up with something to give. Every one of you came here with something that only you can do, and that you're the only one who can do it in that particular way. Nobody else can do it for you. Nobody can live your life for you. And in life, there are no take-backs and there are no do-overs. You just get one life, and that's it. And you owe it to us, because when you don't manifest your greatness, we all become deprived of it. Other people miss out when you're not manifesting your greatness. Manifesting your greatness is to fulfill your life's purpose. I believe that everyone came here with something, something of a grand scale, something that goes far beyond just trying to make it through med school or just trying to get into a residency or just trying to make it through residency. Something far grand beyond that. But the problem is that all too often we get into these lousy states. Not uncommonly you ask your colleague and they tell you, you know, I was on a rotation and that rotation just sucked. I mean, I didn't learn anything. You know, the chief was mean to me, or the residents were too busy, or it was just, it just, it was, the, it was just, you know, dark when I came in in the morning, it's dark when I leave in the evening. You know, it puts you in a lousy state, it brings you down. And I say, yes, it will put you down, if you allow it to. See, I can really, I can sympathize with that. When I was a med student, when I was a junior resident, I used to believe the same thing. When my chief was in a bad mood, I would be in a bad mood. It would put me in a bad mood. If the weather was cold or dark or gloomy, I would feel gloomy. I used to believe that. But the key word is used to believe. See, remember I said beliefs must change. What I realized that was that I was not in any control. See, I, I would say that's it's normal. I thought I'm just not upset for no reason. I'm, something's upsetting me and that's why I feel upset. But what I realized was that I'm actually nothing more than just a slave to my external conditions. I was not in control of my internal conditions. I was allowing my external conditions to affect my internal conditions. And what I didn't know is that I could modify my internal world regardless of what was going on on the outside. And what I realized is that the quickest and easiest way to create that modification is to create an empowering meaning for the situation that you're in. See, one thing that you must do starting now and for the rest of your life, is to create an empowering meaning for everything. You must change what you think things mean and create an empowering meaning for them. Remember this, 
Nothing in this world has any inherent meaning to it. It only has the meaning you assign to it. Shakespeare once said, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So from a practical, pragmatic standpoint, as a surgeon, we modify our internal worlds all the time. We have to. For example, in the trauma room, with all the chaos going on, you must remain calm and collected. You must remain focused and not distracted. You must remain determined and clearly visualize your plan for the patient, and you must make sure that your plan is implemented. Because at the end of the day, they're going to ask you, what were you thinking? When you're taking care of the patient, they're going to ask you why you made those decisions. And remember, decisions, they come back to state. Decision making comes back to state. When you're in a good state, you make better decisions for your patients, and your patients do better. <coughs> this is a perfect example of when you need to get into peak state immediately. You could be sleeping, you could be eating, you could be um, performing some tasks, all of a sudden a trauma comes in, bam, you need to get into peak state, you need to be at your best and you need to do it now. Because you can't be in a weak or lousy state when that trauma patient comes in. Because then it's going to be his life. Another way of modifying your internal conditions, irrespective of your external conditions, is simply by actively directing your own thoughts. Remember, thoughts are what determine state. It's not uncommon for us to think about things that bother us. We think about things that annoy us, we ruminate about what other people said, and that is the best way to put yourself into a lousy state. It's the best way to bring yourself down and to create limited possibilities for yourself. And to th it's to think about things that worry you or bother you or annoy you. They say that most people die because of what they eat. I say most people die because of what's eating them. I mean, think about it. You have the right, the liberty, the freedom, the opportunity, the capacity, whatever you want to call it, to think about anything you want at any time you want to. So why not think about all of the great things, things that make you happy or, fa or, or um, enthusiastic or fantastic or amazing? Or, or ecstatic, or euphoric, or confident, or bold all the time. You can, that's a resource that's readily available to you. You can just tap into that resource and use that to your advantage. You can bring yourself up. Life is hard on its own, and it'll bring you down. You have to be able to bring yourself up. Why not create an empowering meaning for everything that happens to you every day? I mean, every person you meet, every conversation you have, every experience you encounter. See, when you do that, all of a sudden you'll notice that you const you're constantly learning and improving all the time. You'll notice that things start happening for you instead of happening to you. The universe ends up lining up on your side. Opportunities you didn't even know existed start to become apparent. Doors start opening. Doors that you didn't even know existed most importantly, you begin to enjoy the process. Now you notice when that colleague tells you about how that rotation sucked and how everything was he, was, he was unhappy, you go through that same rotation, except the only difference is you go through it in peak state and you go through it creating empowering meetings and then you come out and you say, that rotation wasn't that bad. I don't know what he's talking about. I actually enjoyed it. I actually learned a lot. I met a lot of new people. Life's getting exciting. See, according to many psychologists, the average person has about 50,000 thoughts per day. And they say deep thinkers have about 70,000 thoughts per day. And about 80% of these thoughts are negative thoughts. And 98% of them are the same thoughts you had yesterday. <laughs> talk about creatures of habit and bad habits at that. See, but most of the time, we don't actively direct our own thoughts and think about what we want to think about but rather our, mind, our thoughts have a mind of their own and most of the time they're thinking about things on their own and they're negative thoughts and limiting beliefs. See, if you can attain the skill necessary to direct your own thoughts, you can take your life to a whole other level. I'll give you an example. Captain Gerald Coffey, who was a prisoner of war in Vietnam, and he was held there for seven years. He was chained up for seven years basically held in this small room, like a box, basically. And he underwent daily torture for seven years. 
Now, he had good reason to be panicked and miserable. He had good reason to feel deserted. He had good reason to feel hopeless and to feel depressed, but he didn't. See, he cultivated an internal world that empowered him and that allowed him to grow and expand his consciousness. He stated that as unfortunate as a situation that was, it was one of the best experiences he had in his life. And he taught us that we can go beyond mere survival and emerge from our adversities tougher and more capable of mastering change, achieving success, and finding greater meaning in life. A very similar story, Viktor Frankl, a psychiatrist, survivor of the Holocaust, wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And amidst all the death and destruction and the horrific conditions he was in, he tried to find meaning in all of the awful suffering that was occurring. One of the things he mentions is always having a forward-looking perspective. And there's more than just meaning to life, but meaning to each person's individual life. Finding that purpose in life. You see, when you take on a life with directed thoughts and powerful meanings, your attitude towards life completely changes. See, Charles Swindoll said about attitude, he said, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact attitude has on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, <clears throat> than circumstances, than failures and successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearances, than giftedness or skill. It is something that can make or break a company, that can make or break a church or a home. It is something that can make or break you. The remarkable thing that is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our attitude. That is all we can play. I'm convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. So now that we have established the fact that your attitude, the meanings you attach to things, and your state determine your behavior and your quality of life and the quality of your experiences, you're still probably asking, so how do I get myself into peak state? I mean, how do I get myself from an unresourceful state or a lousy state where I'm feeling down to a state where I'm excited and I'm ready to take on the challenges of life? And how do I maintain that state? I mean, you have a long day of lectures in the OR or lectures or you're in the OR all day, you get home, and now you need to do all your administrative tasks. You're returning all of your emails, doing your case logs, your clinic logs, you have to prepare your M&M, you have to read for cases for the next day, you have to study. Oh yeah, you have to do your research requirements, and that's just in addition to wanting to spend some time with your family, getting some rest, just eat, shower, and sleep before the next day. And what happens if you want to do something extra, like a hobby you enjoy to do, or you want to read for leisure, or I don't know, prepare a motivational speech for med students? <laughs> when are you going to find the time to do that? Not to mention trying to get some exercise, because many residents find themselves gaining weight and getting out of shape when they're in residence. So in order to accomplish all this and, and still maintain your sanity, you have to be at your absolute best. You have to have the energy. You have to be in peak state. So there are many different techniques and strategies and tools and tips for getting into peak state. But for now, I'll tell you that it can broadly be divided into two major categories, and that's focus and physicality. Let me start with physicality since it's relatively simple and intuitive. So the definition of physicality, the state of, or quality of being physical, or the physical characteristics of a person or object. So things that you need to increase your awareness. So your posture, for instance. There have been so many studies to determine the way your posture affects your biochemistry and your physiology. You know you have a long day, and now you have a reading assignment, and you're gonna lay down in bed and read, you know you're kidding yourself. You know you're going to pass out and you're not going to get your reading assignment done. You have to be engaged. You have to sit up and you have to be sitting straight up and be engaged in order to be learning. Uh, smiling. They've done studies that show that even smiling um, changes the biochemistry in your brain and puts you in an elated state of mind. Um, body positioning. If you, if, you, if you know anyone that's been through... Um, um, acting school, they'll tell you that they do this exercise where they have them do different positions. And they'll have these students 
you know, put themselves in like fetal position or sit with their arms or legs crossed for a few minutes and they ask them how they feel. And universally they'll say, you know, I feel limited, I feel small, I feel insignificant, I feel tiny. And then they have them do expansive positions where they spread their arms out, they increase their, you know, their chest diameter, their, their, their physical body takes up more space in the world. This has been shown to, to increase and elate your mood and the way you feel. Your diet, the way we eat, you know, you, 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 you eat something that's high in simple sugars and then you, have, you go to the OR and you're doing a six hour long case and you feel it, you feel tired, you feel hungry. And, uh, and then you still have the anastomosis to sew, you still have to send the guy to the eyes to you, run the list, and then hopefully you can get a meal. The way, you, the way you eat, you have to change the way you eat to make yourself as healthy as possible. Motion. So motion leads to emotion. And the right emotions are energy generators. So physical exercise, so running, it's so much easier to get excited about something when you're physically running or lifting weights or breaking a sweat rather than you're just reclining or laying back. And they'll ask you, I mean, how do you find the energy to do all this? You see, the, the key here that you have to know is that you don't find energy, you create it. It's just like when, if something's important to you, you don't find time for it. You make time to make it happen. Another thing you can do to generate enormous levels of energy and putting yourself into peak state is something called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. This is something that I've learned and has really changed my life. It's been, it's been so beneficial to me. See, anything you say, anything you say to yourself consistently, you'll manifest. So I'll give you an example. I used to wake up every morning about 4 o'clock or so, and I have to come in and round, and I would be exhausted. Every morning I would wake up and I would say, gosh, I'm so tired and exhausted. Every single morning, 4 a.m. waking up, I have to pre-round, I have to eat my cheek. I'm so tired and exhausted. And guess what? Surprising, I was feeling tired and exhausted because I kept on saying it. So I said if I change, if I do this neuro-linguistic program and I change what I say to myself, maybe it'll change my physiology. So what I did was I wrote on a piece of paper and I said, um, I wrote, today is a new and exciting day. And I put it next to my alarm clock and I would, I would remind myself to wake up and read it. So I wake up and the first, the first day I remember I woke up and I read it and I said, I read it, I said, today is a new and exciting day. And then I said, oh, who are you kidding? It's still 4 a.m. Nothing's changed. I'm still tired. But I decided to keep doing it. And I said, every day I would wake up and I would say, today is a new and exciting day. Today is a new and exciting day. And after a couple of days, I started to get convinced. I said, well, it is a new day. I couldn't believe that. <laughs> And I kept on, I kept on doing it. I kept on doing it, and before I, and then I started to say, well, actually, I can, I can determine how excited I want to be about it, because it's not the actual day that's exciting, but that's the emotion that I want to cultivate within myself. You know, it's, it's interesting. You see, um, you see some people, and they, for instance, they look under the microscope, and they're like, wow, now this is fascinating. And you get another person that says. It's just a bunch of red dots, like, to care. But they're fascinated by it. Then another person looks through a telescope, and he looks into outer space, and he's like, wow, that's amazing. Another person says, dude, get back to Earth. We live here. Stop, you know, there's nothing so crazy about that. So I realized it's not the actual thing that's exciting or fascinating. It's your interpretation of that thing. It's that feeling in your body. That's what you want to cultivate. It's not the actual thing itself. So then I started, I found myself saying every morning, today is a new and exciting day. It's a new day to grow, to expand, to contribute, to operate, to help and heal those in need. And now I jump out of bed and being tired or exhausted is not even, there's nothing that I'm even feeling. I'll give you another example. I started doing this um, as a chief resident when I started getting bombarded with consults. And a lot of times we'll be at the very busy hospitals where you get 15, 20 consults, multiple trauma patients, people going to the OR, you have multiple teams, you're trying to coordinate all at the same time. And it's easy to get overwhelmed by all of that going on at the same time. And I would take a two minute break and I would just take a deep breath, affect my posture, my breathing, my physicality. I would start to say, all I need is within me now. All I need is within me now. 
all I need is within me now. And I would say that, and all of a sudden you start to feel your physiology changing. You can actually alter your biochemistry in your brain and do it to your favor. I started doing that, and all of a sudden, I would say, let's go. The appendix will take care of it. Gallbladder, perf diverticulitis, the guy in septic shock, he needs a central line, we need to put a chest tube in. Boom, 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 boom. We do all that. Because in surgery and residency, you need that second win. And you need that third win, and that fourth win, and that fifth win. Because you do a whole day of operating, you're tired at 6, 7 p.m., and you're now you've got to start a new 12 hours. A new 12 hours of operating and dealing with traumas and dealing with craziness. You need those second and third wins. Just like those, you see these those boxers when they go up to their fight, they don't just run up to the ring and just say, hey, throw me a pair of trunks and they just fight. No, they warm themselves up, they get into that state. You see these like these bodybuilders, they're like about to do this big bench press with all this weight. You see them like marching back and forth and puffing and puffing and getting themselves into that state to, to push that weight. You have to push against resistance. That's how their muscles expand. They expand by demand, and you have to expand by demand. That's what's going to happen. Now that's all physicality. Now for focus. See, you feel what you focus on. See, if you focus on something that's compelling, something that's important to you, something that pulls you, that will also generate enormous levels of energy. I remember sometimes waking up when those days when I was so tired and exhausted, and my, day, my goal for the day was to just get through the day. My goal would be just to get through the day or just to get through the week or just to get through the rotation. That's not a compelling reason to wake up in the morning. That's not a compelling reason to be alive. That doesn't pull you and make you want to, to go to work in the morning just to get through the day. You have to create an impelling, a compelling reason to be alive. And you have to focus on it. And if you focus on the wrong things, it will drain your energy. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I had this lady a couple weeks ago, actually. And um, I was called by the ED. 88-year-old lady had obstructing colon cancer. I looked at her CAT scan, looked at her vitals, her labs. She had this colon cancer basically blocking her right colon. I went down there, and I found this old lady, she's 80 years old. She's sitting there crying inconsolably in her bed. She had this big pile of tissues. And, um, and I said, hey, what's going on? She said, oh, didn't you hear? I said, hear what? She said, um, about my diagnosis. I said, what diagnosis? She said, I have uh, a cancer obstructing my intestines. I said, yeah. And she said, how could this happen? I've done everything right. I ate so well. I, uh, I've been exercising. I even had a colonoscopy. I had a colonoscopy five years ago. How did they miss this on my colonoscopy? What happened to my colonoscopy? Where's my colonoscopy report? How did they miss this on my colonoscopy? And then all of a sudden, I, just, I had to interrupt her pattern. And I yelled at her. And I said, stop. Stop it right now. And I said, you're very old, lady. <laughs> I said, I said, do you know what that means? I had to create, a, I had to create a, a, an empowering meaning for her. I knew the state that she was in, she was not going to create any empowering meanings for herself. She said, what, what do you mean? I said, I said, you've lived a long life. Do you know what that means? She said, she's like looking at me all confused. She said, what do you mean? I said, that means you must have been through a lot of tough times in your life. Otherwise, you would have never made it this far. Do you agree with that? She said, yeah, I have been. I said, you must have been through a lot. You must have seen a lot to make it this far. Otherwise, you would have never survived. She said, you're right. I'm a tough old word. I said, yeah, you're 88 years old. And of all the tough times in your life, this has got to be the toughest. You have just got diagnosed with obstructing colon cancer. And of all the tough times in your life, this is the time that you need to be the toughest. She said, yeah, you're right. I said, yeah, we can either focus on what happened five years ago, or we can focus on what we're going to do now. She said, yeah, I can't have my kids and grandkids see me like this. I have five kids and 17 grandkids. I said, yeah, is this what you want them to remember you by? You crying like this? She said, she said no. All of a sudden, she threw all the tissues on the floor, and she said, all right, where do we go from here? I said, you're going to need surgery, and we're going to need to address it. She said, she said, all right, I want my surgery, and I want it now. <laughs> all of a sudden, shoot, this lady was in peak state. All of a sudden, we took her to the OR. We did an open right hemicolectomy. This lady was walking around, 
post-op day zero. She was out of the hospital post-op day three at 88 after a big open right hemicolectomy. I had never seen anything like that. It's all about focus, all about state. I could have easily just tried to console, oh, I'm sorry, it's okay. But I changed her state. When you're in a powerful state, you make different decisions and you take different actions. It's those challenging times in your life. Those are challenging times. You're going to see many challenging times. It's those challenging times in your life that you have to stand up within yourself and you have to look at life in the eye and you know that life doesn't blink. And neither must you. Sometimes you just have to grab life by the collar and say, not with me and not today. Sometimes you just have to step up to the plate and you just have to swing for the fences because you know that the ball is not going out of the park unless you intend for it to go there. See, when you create a compelling goal and you align yourself with all the reasons as to why you want that goal, you go to another level in your life. Friedrich Nietzsche, Nietzsche said, he who has strong enough why to live for can bear almost any how. If you're worried about how you're going to get something done, there's no need to worry. As long as you know why you want it, you will figure out how it will get done. Once you find that goal, that goal that has significant meaning to you, you'll be so energized, so full of life, you'll feel that aliveness within you, that being tired or burnt out won't even be part of your vocabulary. See, you're going to have this competitive edge. It's going to be apparent. People will notice it, and you're going to amaze them. More importantly, you're going to amaze yourself. And you're going to fulfill that life purpose, that thing that you came with, that you're going to manifest that. You'll be sure of it. You'll be so sure. You'll be like those NBA players. You see these NBA players, they shoot the ball, and before the ball even makes it to the net, they're already running down to play defense. They know that it's in. They know that they've made it, that they've, made, they've got the points. It's done. It's finished. They're certain. You know, it's like, you ever like walk out of the USMLE or you walk out the app site and you know you've got a 99. You call your loved one and you say, hey, guess what? I just took the USMLE, I got a 99. How do you know that? I got the score already? No, but I knew all the answers. I got them all right, so I, I know. And then six weeks later, your report card comes in and guess what? You get a 99. Because you know you're certain about it. It's a good feeling. Another, one last thing. These, um, these, you know these NBA players and these, these Olympic athletes, they, do, they practice something called mental imagery, where they just sit down and they imagine themselves um, doing that perfect golf swing, and, or, or crossing the finish line, or throwing that perfect jump, throw, jump shot. Um, there's, they've actually done studies on medical students, and they've done it on surgeons, and they found that mental imagery in surgery um, actually increases your performance. People who actually practice suturing practically, and then imagining themselves actually performing it, perform better as well. So to answer the first question we started with, how do you prepare for this chaos in advance? You have to visualize it, internalize it, experience it in your mind in advance, visualize yourself winning and crossing that finish line. I mean, when you dream, you're the superstar of your dream. You don't dream of yourself wiping up the sweat after all the other players on the court. <laughs> you don't dream of yourself sitting on the bench watching the game. You are the champion of your dreams. So in conclusion, number one, you must create an empowering meaning for everything. Number two, you must always be in peak state. Number three, use your physical body and the power of your mind to get into peak state. And number four, share this with everyone you know, because when we improve ourselves individually, we all benefit from this, and we all improve collectively, because collectively, our efforts become synergistic and our results expand exponentially. Thank you.
Well, I mean, so, you know, I wish I knew this before I started. It would have saved me a lot of trial and error. I think there's a lot, there's a couple different ways that people learn things. People learn through trial and error, and people learn through other people's experiences. And, you know, they say that, um, you know, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. And it's better if you learn from someone who's already been there and done that. So, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of these moments where, you know, things get crazy and you just have to figure it out. You have to learn and you have to utilize resources. And I've learned that, you know, a lot of people look to the outside for resources. And, they, and that's, that, that's not what helps them. It's internal resourcefulness. It's that inner resourcefulness that helps you. You know, and I, and I just come to realize that as time progresses. Like I said in the beginning, it really changes your whole perspective on things. You see people dying. You see people dying. And you see that you're the limiting factor. Like, you are actually the limiting factor. Like you're the one standing there. You're the one calling the shots. You're, once you have MD at the end of your name, they will be asking you what to do, and you're accountable. And they're going to ask you, what were you thinking? Why did you make that decision? So what determines your decisions and your thoughts? You know, you have to be confident. You have to know what you're talking about. Because people's lives depend on it. People's lives actually depend on it. It's very different than the classroom. It's very different than just studying and answering multiple choice questions. Um, so you talked a lot about getting into the Let's say you do all that, you do the best that you can, and then still things don't go the way that you planned for them to, which I'm sure happens a lot. But how do you deal with that? How do you get back into the PCF? Terrible. I mean, so hard. I mean, there, so there's so many, I, maybe we should have more talks, because there's so many different ways <laughs> to actually get into the state. So many different ways. You just have to take control of your state. You know, one thing I like to do, for instance, me personally, I collect motivational or inspiring quotes. I have hundreds of thousands of them. I have books that just, I just bought a book. It says, it's the book of positive quotation. It has thousands of them, <laughs> over, over hundreds of years. And I just read them. They change your state when you read positive things. You must constantly be aligning yourselves with positive things. Negative things will bring you down. I'm telling you, if you let it, life will just clobber you to the ground. It will kick dirt in your face, I'm telling you. You must not allow that to happen. You have to be your number one advocate. You have to be looking out for yourself. You can't be criticizing yourself. And you just have to cultivate it. These internal resources, you cultivate them. You build them. You don't just become chief resident right after you graduate medical school. It's a five-year program. It's a process. But you have to take the most out of every single individual day. Otherwise, time will go by and you're like, shit, I wish I should, I should have known this by now. I don't know how to do it. I'm not prepared. And it's a scary feeling, especially when someone's dying. You know, I, and you see it. You see different residents. You see some residents more capable than others. And you see the outcome. You come to the, the way that, so when you're in residency, the way that you're going to be judged by other residents is you come in in the morning and you get sign out and you'll see what's left over and what wasn't done from the night before. And you're like, how come this didn't get done? Oh, you know, we never got a chance to do it. Or they dumped stuff on you. Or the patient didn't do well. Or they missed it. And they missed something. The guy was on DBT prophylaxis, and now he's dying from a PE. You're like, well, how come no one checked up on that? How come no one, uh, how come no one, you know, notified somebody about this? Or how come this never get done? And you come in, and now you have to deal with all of this. Versus you get signed out from another resident. Oh, everything was done. Everybody did fine. There were no issues. And he has no complication rates. You see it. Like, it's apparent. You know, and, and, the, and the problem is our outcomes are patients' lives. Like the way we grade ourselves, our yardstick of success, are other people's outcomes. You know, you have a guy, he, he's been on the other patient service. Oh yeah, that guy, uh, that guy's floundering. No, one, no, one's, um, no one's been checking up on him. Or no one replaced his lab. Or no one replaced his electrolytes or this or that. You know? So you just, you just have to just envision, just, you just have to create meaning.